Dear friends, we meet at a critical time, not just for the movements of revolt in the Arab world, but also at a critical time for the capitalist system, which has been put in place, this particular variant of it, which has been in place since the 90s. The Washington Consensus, neoliberalism, a capitalism based largely on financialization, not on production, especially in the Western world, and what we have seen in the Arab world, something that erupted early this year and continues in different shapes and forms that we will discuss in a minute, but we've now seen developments outside the Arab world and connected to it. The fact that the example and inspiration of the citizens who collected each day and stayed each night in Tehdi Square in Cairo at the beginning of the year, we have seen being reproduced in public squares in Barcelona and Madrid. We have seen aspects of that, the occupation of Constitution Square, outside the Parliament buildings in Athens. And I know for a fact that the anti-war movement in Britain is planning to occupy Trafalgar Square to mark the 10th anniversary of the war on Afghanistan this fall. So this emergence and eruption of public anger is something that people are learning from. And these are important developments because for a long time it was assumed that the triumph, the victory of capitalism, the fact that no one stood up against it, the, the, the fact that no alternatives were considered possible, and many assumed that that was the end, and many made their peace with the system, including numerous people who were once on the left and ended up on the front bench of new labor cabinets. <coughs> and not just new labor, Masoch in Greece, the Socialist Party in France. All over Europe, the shift from the left to the right was very noticeable. That shift, I think, for a new generation, a generation which is growing up as we speak, the generation of 18-year-olds to 24-year-olds, that is no longer possible because they see with their own eyes what is going on. And I was very interested to see in today's Financial Times <coughs> that the result of opinion poll service on the public sector strikes in Britain, that the largest support for the strikers and for the right to strike against the cuts came from 18 to 26 year olds. Overwhelming, two to one in favor. And it is when this generation <laughs> and it is when this generation sees through the mask, sees through the lies of the system, that hope is revived once again. And so that is why I said we are living in critical times. How they will end is uncertain. But what these critical times mark in my opinion, is the end of the long transition that began in 1991. So from here, and from that point of view, we look at the Arab world. An Arab world in which the West thought it was so completely dominant, economically, ideologically, politically, and militarily that they could do anything on the key issue which has haunted the Arab world since 1948, the question of Israel, the repression of the Palestinians, 
the refusal of the Israelis and their backers to grant the Palestinians the right to self-determination. Uh, they thought that they would end this problem by signing a peace treaty with the Egyptian military. At that time, uh, under the leadership of Anwar Sadat. And once they'd done that, they thought that the game was over. Egypt, strategically, militarily, economically even, the most important country in the Arab world was in the back, and that was it. And they accepted everything. And when I mean they, I don't just mean the powers that be, the United States and the leaders of the European Union. I mean all those ideologues. I mean all those media pundits who went along with them and backed them. And for whom the fact that people could be renditioned off the streets of, from Europe and tortured in the prison cells of Cairo, in Afghanistan, in Jordan, in Saudi Arabia, that was all fine. Because the world had become divided into the friend-enemy nexus, which went very deep. Anyone who was a friend of the rulers of the West was fine, and anyone they determined and declared as an enemy had to be fought. And that was the overwhelming trust of the media pillars. So what happened? It's not that it happened. This is one impression we have to correct. It is not that the Arab world was dead before that. There was anger. And there were huge demonstrations in solidarity with the first Palestinian in the father in the early years of this century. Huge. There was anger that nothing was being done. There were strikes, small strikes, but important strikes in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Algeria. Workers beginning to realize that they had to struggle in order to get somewhere. None of these was on a huge scale. But they built up. In many cases, they were crushed. In some cases, there was huge repression, but people didn't forget. Then we had, not so long ago in Egypt, a movement spearheaded by largely middle-class activists, but with lots of support and sympathy from other sectors in Egypt, the Kafia movement, the enough, we have had enough. That too didn't get anywhere. And ultimately, the country imploded as many Egyptians were saying privately, one day, sooner or later, the entire country will say enough. And that happened. And they got rid of the despot. Not easily, not peacefully, because lots of them were killed. And the killers are still not being tried for war crimes or whatever crimes they want to try them under, they should be. The former interior minister who ordered the security services in to go and kill people is still not in prison, still not being tried in Egypt. Mubarak had to be dragged away struggling and screaming, refusing to go. And ultimately, I am told by something which has not been made officially public, that the Egyptian military had taped his conversation with senior Israeli figures in the Israeli military in Mossad, in which Mubarak was heard saying, can't we have a diversionary attack on the Egyptian border by you? That will divert the army and give me time to crush them. And when the military found this, he was told, we have the proof, we have the tapes, and you have to leave now or you'll be arrested and tried for high treason. So it took a lot to get him out. And the fall of the despot in Tunisia initially and subsequently in Egypt created shockwaves. 
the United States, the dominant power in the region, could not believe what was happening. That before their eyes, someone that they had backed was crumbling. Their European allies, likewise. Till the last moment, new Labour dignitaries, even though they were out of power, like Mandelson and gang, were saying that actually Mubarak's son, Gamal Mubarak, hated in Egypt, was a very decent and respectable figure. <clears throat> and they were saying that because they had their entire future based on Mubarak being replaced by his son. And CNN television would introduce Gamal Mubarak when he made his frequent trips to the United States as here is Gamal Mubarak, the future president of Egypt. Democracy didn't come into it. <clears throat> so all this system which they had built up of backing Mubarak, backing family dictatorships in the Middle East, began to collapse. And then they panicked. I mean, they tried to keep Mubarak in power. Many of you will remember Hillary Clinton's infamous remark when she was asked, what do you think of Mubarak and what's going on in Egypt? She said, Bill and I have always regarded Hosni Mubarak as family. <laughs> which at least had the merit of honesty. <laughs> because he was part of their family, and the family of the Western uh, uh, countries and Western states. Now we come to what happens after the fall of the dictator, brought about power by huge mass mobilizations, not just in Cairo, not just in Perry Square, but all over the country, there was one single day on which there were at least 10 million, if not 12 million people out on the streets of the entire country. That is a huge figure. A huge figure. Alexandria was taken over by its people and held for 48 hours. So it was a mass movement which was refusing to take no for an answer, refusing to be crushed, and people had lost their fear of death. And when people lose that fear, then they can genuinely achieve miracles. And they did in Egypt. They did something no one had thought was possible. But they weren't necessarily thinking about what lay ahead. Everyone wanted democracy, wanted democratic elections, wanted a new constitution. And that these are still important demands. The military now, which has been in power one way or the other in Egypt since uh, the late 50s of the last century, <clears throat> having helped to get rid of Mubarak, having refused to back him, was essentially on its top levels composed of people who had after all worked with this guy and on the payroll of the United States for many long years, since the 70s. What were they going to do? The Americans and the Pentagon insisted that in order to, make, to get a peaceful transition to democracy, as they said, uh, it was necessary to keep these people in power. The initial American candidate to replace Mubarak was his deputy, Suleiman. Not just the former head of the secret police, but a guy who personally engaged in torture. Personally tortured people. Didn't just order it. And they wanted him to replace Mubarak. When they were told this was unacceptable, then the, the provisional arrangement was made, but as effectively, uh, Tantawi in, in charge. But what were the forces in Egypt underlying this? Here you have to be clinical, precise. Main force in Egypt is the Muslim Brotherhood. Let's have no two ways about that. It's not the only force, but it's the best organized force in the country, for good or for bad. 
and they played it cleverly. They told their supporters, finally, they were nervous at the beginning, you have to go and join the movement, but go without banners, no shouting of Allahu Akbar, none of the chants that might frighten anyone in the West, keep very calm, let's just get rid of this so and so. And they did. And now what? They're divided. There is a large faction in the Brotherhood which is prepared to do deals and is negotiating behind the scenes with the United States for a transition in which they play a huge role. They might, whether they win an overall majority is an open question. In a free election, I don't think that they would win an overall majority, but they certainly would be the largest political party in the country. Uh, what will they do? I think they will essentially do two things. One, they will not change the economic system, because their model is very much the Turkish government. And in Turkey, not simply are the Turkish Islamists a pillar of NATO, they sometimes step out of line as they did very early on on Iraq or on Palestine, but essentially they keep the system under control. And that system which they work is the neoliberal financialized system of capital. Now, <clears throat> and they had managed it very successfully. So the Turkish regime, conservative socially, conservative politically, liberal in the neoliberal sense economically, has become a model for most of the Muslim Brotherhood groups all over the Middle East. So that is what they'll get, and we shouldn't have any illusions about that. The question is, will they permit a space in these countries for other people to organize? That is what becomes critically important now. And I think it will be very difficult for them to constrict this space, certainly in the early days after an election takes place. Because precisely of the way they themselves will have been propelled to power. So <clears throat> the existence and creation of a new political space, which is open to new social and political forces in that part of the world, is the big gain of the movement so far. And we can't underestimate it, because in this part of the world, by and large, Political repression was very severe of a sort we have not ever witnessed in Europe since the Second World War, <coughs> with the exceptions of the Spanish, uh, Greek, and Portuguese dictatorships. And how this space is utilized and how these movements develop is important. The one thing, tiny on its scale, but these artificial attempts to create civil society via NGOs, supposedly, non-governmental organizations, is now utterly and completely irrelevant, if it was ever relevant. And the reason for that is that the function of these NGOs, or the WGOs, as I christened them once, Western governmental organizations, <laughs> was essentially to try and divide people from each other. So you have an NGO and you can do a survey on this particular textile factory, but you can't do a survey on the whole of Egypt. That is what you concentrate on. So it was a very clear aim at division. And the movements have overridden that. And I'm, you know, the, the, the press which makes a great deal of the social networks, we now have the figures. The maximum number of people mobilized through Facebook throughout the Egyptian, especially in Cairo, which was the main center, was 70 to 80,000. That's good. You know, I'm not at all downplaying it. It's excellent and it's very important. But let's not exaggerate. Essentially, people gathered as they used to in the old days, using whatever means they could. Neighbors talking to each other, people on the phone, people sending messages, all these things have happened. But critically now, what remains to be seen is what happens in the rest of the Arab world, and of course in Egypt. 
And before I leave Egypt, the, 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 what struck fear in the hearts of Washington and Tel Aviv was the fact that a democratically elected government in Egypt might end the treaty, so-called peace treaty with Israel, via which the Palestinians have been kept down. That is what they hope, and not just the Palestinians. I don't know how many of you know the terms of this treaty. According to the terms of this treaty, the Egyptian military could not move within its own country unless it had previously notified the Israeli government. It was a humiliation, complete humiliation. And people feel that, and this crosses the class divide and many other divides. So <clears throat> I think it will be modified. Many of the elements in this treaty will be renegotiated. The key thing on whether they carry on recognizing Israel depends on who's elected. The Brotherhood, I think, will maintain the line of the Turkish Islamists, which is, do not withdraw recognition. That is what they will do. And then we will have a debate on it. Briefly, elsewhere in the <coughs> Arab world, what is the, the overall balance sheet? Tunisia, the situation is not so different from Egypt in terms of the fact that a lot of the previous people are still hanging on to key positions. And there are also threats via the G8 that we will only give you lots of money to recover, provided you don't allow the Islamists to come to power. Well, how can you stop it if you have democratic elections and they win a large number of seats? You can't stop it. But that is the pressure being put on the Tunisians uh, uh, at this uh, precise moment. The overall balance sheet, of course, is positive. Three despots down. <laughs> Mubarak, Ben Ali, and now this joker in Yemen, who <clears throat> had really to be forced out by a rocket attack on his palace. Because he was refusing to go, he was killing people day in and day out. <clears throat> the repression in Yemen has barely been reported in the Western media. The large-scale killings that have been going on in the south of Yemen on the pretext that we are fighting Al-Qaeda, a pretext supported by most mainstream newspapers in Europe and America. They have a big Al-Qaeda base. I tell you, I was in Yemen uh, uh, just over a year ago, and I spoke to the country's former prime minister, totally conservative guy, and I asked him up front, and reported it, I said, could you tell me what is the estimate of Al-Qaeda members in Yemen? What is the rough estimate? He smiled and, you know, said, well, you know, quite cynically. I said, let me guess, three, four hundred? Not so much. <laughs> <laughs> A complete and utter joke. And they use the fact. And, and I tell you how they operate. I met a family of well-known journalists who managed to keep a radical oppositionist newspaper going since time immemorial. The regime banned it when they published photographs of how former members of the Yemeni army from South Yemen, for those who don't know or have forgotten, Yemen was two republics, one, the South Yemen Republic, in the hand of Marxists and left-wingers for some time who imploded and started killing each other, uh, as they did in Afghanistan a few years later. And the right took advantage of this <clears throat> and pushed through a reunification. But the left in South Yemen had pushed through land reform had made education possible for women, had begun to transform the structure of that country, and had created a new consciousness. This was one of the good things they did. When they were reunified, the northern barons and tribal leaders came and occupied them and tried to crush them and crush their identity. And even now they refer to them as those socialists in the south. 
And so any sign of opposition in the South, first they used to say they are socialists, we have to crush them, now they say they are Al-Qaeda, they are the same people. And this journalist family, they tried to kill the head of the guy who owned the newspaper. They picked up his son and locked him up. They unleashed the military, a barrage attack on the house of this family in Aden. Luckily, the family had underground cellars and they hid in them. And when I interviewed them last year, they said to me, the plan was very easy. They had killed some poor people off the streets, put them in the boot of their car. They were going to kill us. And a senior policeman said the plan was to kill you people and say that we'd found these Al-Qaeda people already dead in the boot of their car in your house. And that's why we had to fight. That's how they operate. These are the sorts of regimes the West supports. <clears throat> and then they have the nerve to teach us lessons about what is democratic and what is undemocratic. So in Yemen, the guys fallen. Social tensions are high. The South is on the verge of rebellion. Often you see in villages in the south, the old South Yemeni flags going up. And the portraits of these robes in Sana'a in the north being, being, being torn and burnt in public. <clears throat> so we will see, it's not over what is likely to happen in Yemen. And I saw with my own eyes US agents in various hotels pretending to be tourists. I mean, you know. <laughs> setting up essentially small combat units like they do in Pakistan to target who? 200 people. I'll never forget, I was in uh, Hadramut, an area which is virtually out of bounds and some Japanese tourists were killed and I went into Shibam, the city near where they'd been killed and I asked people and the head of one of the leading council members in the village, he came and you know, we met and talked, I said by the way, where are Al Qaeda? Are they in town? I wouldn't mind a word with them. <laughs> and he came up and whispered in my ear. He said, Brother Tarek, should I tell you where Al Qaeda is in Yemen? I said, Tell me. He said, They are kept in a special office near the president. <laughs> That is Yemen. And then we have Libya, where a movement started, a popular movement, from below. And as many members of the Libyan regime began to peel off and move in that direction, the West didn't wait for this movement to sort itself out. They waited in Egypt. They disrupted the movement in Bahrain by encouraging a Saudi intervention to crush the mass movement in Bahrain, where young people had gathered in the square in Bahrain chanting, neither Sunni, neither Shia, we are Bahrainis, we are Bahrainis. They sent in the Saudis who sectarianized the conflict by saying this is a war against the Shia who are a majority of that tiny state. And then they'd be crushing them. Only yesterday a doctor gave evidence of how he was tortured by the Saudi secret police in Bahrain. And then they intervene in Libya. For what? For two reasons. One, to reassert their hegemony in the region, having been taken by surprise. B, to get control of the opposition, because Libya is not a poor country in terms of its wealth and see to show, look, at last we're on the side of democracy. But having done so, I think they have managed now to make sure that whatever happens in Libya over the next months, the Libyan people's movement will have been defeated, with Gaddafi on one side and NATO bombers on the other. What hope is there for a democratic popular movement? And the businessmen they are lining up in Qatar and other places to be part of the provisional government are already negotiating oil deals with foreign oil companies, including in Beijing. That is what is going on. And it always angers me 
when there's a so-called Western humanitarian intervention, a few new people peel away. They don't seem to learn the lessons. We've had these humanitarian interventions before. After the occupation of Iraq, all these politicians said, well, okay, the, even those who had opposed the war, maybe the war was bad, but at least we've got rid of Saddam. And the implication there used to be that you needed the West to get rid of a despot. Well, the Arab movements which erupted early this year has shown that you need people if the despots are going to get rid of them. what the Iraqi people would have done without this appalling slaughter and killing and massacre and genocide that took place. Over a million Iraqis dead. And politicians in the Western world don't care about it. These great humanitarians trying to lock up X and Y, bring them before the war crimes tribunal, for offenses which are nothing. They're awful, but they're nothing compared to what happened in Iraq. And they walk around. Every single party which has hopes of coming to power in the Western world today bows and scrapes before the United States. I mean, look at this little twit. Ed Miliband. <laughs> he's barely out of his nappies and he's flying to Afghanistan to be photographed with our brave soldiers in Helmand. What the hell is a leader of a party meant to be the opposition? Meant to be the opposition doing here? So we have a strange situation. People in Europe are learning from the Arab world. At the same time, politics in the West, mainstream politics in the West, is dominated by parties of the center-left and center-right who do exactly the same things, regardless of whether they're in power or in opposition. Britain is a country today where there is, formally speaking, no opposition. Think about that. No opposition. All they say on the domestic plans of the coalition government are, we would have done the cuts better. <laughs> That's all they say. When the whole, uh, health service, constantly under threat, was being threatened, the Labour frontbench guy actually supported the reforms. The reforms. No wonder young people are angry. And this is why, both in the Arab world and in Europe, we need to popularize social movements, political movements that bring people together. And we have to come up with alternatives, concrete alternatives as what could be done even before you reach any point of major revolutionary upheaval. Transitional plans, transitional programs to unite people, to bring them together. This is what is lacking. <laughs> it's lacking in Spain, where they voted in the square, in their tens of thousands, not to allow the leaders of the Spanish trade unions to come into the square. Even I was a bit taken aback when I rang friends in Madrid. They said that if the young say these people are complicit with what the Spanish socialists are doing, we don't want them with us. I can understand that. But a necessary corollary to that is the development of politics, <laughs> is to put politics at the center of the movements against this and to come up with alternatives, with what during the days of the English Revolution used to be called remonstrances. Let's have a grand remonstrance. Let's get five million people involved 
to sign a charter of aims. Let's learn from, from our own history here and in other parts of the world. The Arab people are learning fast and they go back to their history as well. They remember what they managed to achieve when they nationalized the Suez Canal, when their country was invaded by uh, uh, three powers to try and crush that. They know how the Palestinians have resisted and fought back despite the bad times into which they have fallen. And so we can learn <clears throat> from each other in how to take this great movement forward. But at the heart of that move forward lies one word, politics. It cannot be done without politics and developing an alternative political, social, economic way of moving forward. I, and I was in Greece uh, uh, three weeks ago in Thessaloniki, actually speaking at a festival of literature, but there was a big audience, and naturally most of them didn't want to ask me questions about literature. <laughs> <laughs> and one of them, I think he was a Pasok sympathizer, and he said, you're being very critical of the Greek government, what would you do? And this is always a difficult question, because since we're not in power, it seems very abstract. But I said, look, I'm not sure what I would do personally, uh, since I'm only an individual. But were a mass movement to propel me and others like me into parliament, and we had a majority, then I can say what we would do collectively, not me as an individual, which is neither here nor there. I said the first thing we would do is default. And so, it is not our responsibility. It is not the responsibility of Greek workers and peasants and public sector workers and students and unemployed middle class layers to pay off the French and German banks who thought they'd make a quick buck by a Greek. I said, of course this would create a crisis, but it would be a creative crisis, not a crisis in which we despair. It would create a crisis of ideology and a crisis of the way forward, which should be discussed in huge popular assemblies in Greek towns, big and small, where alternatives are put and voted on. I said you have mayors in Thessaloniki and Athens who don't belong to any party, who are popular and trusted because they are not corrupt. That's a start. But you need to move beyond that. And how to organize and live in a world in which the rights of the collective, the people, the masses, the poor, is put before the interests of the bankers. It can be done. And I gave them concrete examples from how it is being done in some Latin American countries. And that was <laughs> so it's not that it's utopian. It's not that it's utopian. It can be done. And the result of that intervention, tiny though it was, that I was for the rest of the afternoon talking to people in the city. Now I just say this to you, that this is a tiny incident. Tiny, tiny incident. But it shows what the needs are and what people really want, which their politicians are not supplying. So this is a movement for the left and left of all sorts to move outwards, not inwards. Extremely important.